نبدا يعني بمثال من الولايات المتحده عندنا مشكله حاليا بعدم توزيع الموارد الماديه وغير ذلك في قطاع الصحه و شكرا يفضل عالم حيث والدي والد اغلب الموجودين غير موجودين يفضل عالم عندما والدي حاشته سكته قلبيه لا يتم احد ان يساعده ان يذهب ويموت بشكل طبيعي لان والدي لا يعمل لان والدي ليس اضافه لهذا العالم هذا تفكير راس مالي بحت تفكير اليوم اي شخص لا ياتي بمال لهذه الطاوله فليمت That's Jasper and Majid from two rival universities here in the United States in a practice debate competition as they prepare for the National Arabic Debating Championships. If you're wondering what they're debating, the topic is whether or not to let humans die of natural causes after they reach the age of 50. The universities in question, Duke University and UNC Chapel Hill, rivals in sport, academics, and Arabic debating. Ahlan wa sahlan, and welcome to this All Things Arabic podcast with me, your host, Ustaza Karonin. For those who are new to this podcast, which is produced by QFI, we tackle the key issues for Arabic teachers and Arabic learning in primary and secondary schools outside the Arab world. In this episode, we will meet Jasper and Majid to find out about Arabic debating here in the U.S., why they like it, the benefits it brings, and we explore just how fierce that rivalry truly is. Let's get a glimpse now. This is the advice they have for each other ahead of the national championships. So I would say number one is to look out for us, and number two is to bring their best because we want a good debating uh, competition this time. My advice to the other team, I think the other team should not rest on their laurels. I think they should, they should uh, not get too confident. The first clip was from Majid El Munife. He's a third-year student of electrical engineering and computer science at Duke and their debate team captain. He's a native Arabic speaker from the Gulf who grew up going to school in Kuwait. Then we heard from Jasper Shute, UNC debate team captain, who is majoring in global studies and speaks not just Arabic, but Russian and Mandarin too, and has started learning Kazakh. Masha Allah. So, which team will triumph? Which shade of blue is better? light Carolina blue or dark Duke blue. Last year, Duke and UNC students joined forces to win the third U.S. University's Arabic Debating Championship. In mid-October, they will face off at the fourth United States Arabic Debate Championships in Utah. We join them as their teams prepare for the competition, as they perfect the power of hashtag speaking Arabic. Will you be Hashtag Team UNC or Hashtag Team Duke. Let's start with Jasper. And for full transparency, I teach Arabic at UNC Chapel Hill, so you know where my allegiance lies. Ahlan wa sahlan ya Jasper. Marhaba, Ustaza. Marhaba, it's great to have you with us today on All Things Arabic. I'm excited to be here. Yes, we're excited to learn more about Arabic debating on the college level and learn more about your journey learning Arabic as well as leaning into Arabic debating. How did you start your Arabic language learning journey? I started learning Arabic in the fall of 2019. I was fortunate enough to receive a scholarship here at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, the Moorhead Kane, um, and they paid for me to spend a year living in Amman, studying at the Qasid Institute, as I'm sure some listeners some listeners surely are familiar with, with, with Qasid. And that was it. I arrived in Jordan, and I didn't know a single word of Arabic. I knew shukran, but I would say that I probably pronounced it incorrectly. And the rest is history. I made lifelong friends in the first three or four months of living there and now go back to Amman at least every year, if not more. Um, and that's wow. just what gave me my kind of love for, for Arabic. Yes, for all of our listeners, shukran is thank you. But I'm glad that you went to Amman knowing shukran. Yeah, very that's, helpful. So how did you go from learning Arabic, majoring in Russian as one of your majors at UNC, to getting involved with Arabic debating? I mean, what first 
drew me to Arabic debate was just that it was an opportunity to practice my Arabic. Um, at that point, my freshman year, I had already maxed out of Arabic classes that were offered in university here. And so I was looking for some way to kind of bring my Arabic into the realm of intellectual discourse, political discourse, you know, discussing issues in a way that um, isn't kind of constrained to the classroom. Um, but I, I'm competitive, and, and so I found that I actually enjoyed it a lot. And how big or popular would you say Arabic debating is in the U.S.? Well, on one hand, you'd say not that popular, because when you tell people that you do debate in Arabic, mm -hmm. people are confused or, you know, will kind of say, what? Okay. Um, but then when you go to Arabic debate competitions, um, this will be my second U.S. University's Arabic debate championship this fall. There are a lot of students there. There are a ton of people, and every region of the country is represented, public schools, private schools, people of different backgrounds, native speakers, obviously non-native speakers, mm -hmm. um, international students, some international, you know, people of, of non-Arab background like myself. Um, mm -hmm. So it is quite popular, I would say. What would you say is one of the most challenging aspects of debating in Arabic? To me, the hardest aspect of debating in Arabic is just that things take longer. It takes longer to think. For me, you know, there's as good as you can get as a non-native speaker, there's still a challenge in forcing yourself to do something really hard and oftentimes quite stressful mm -hmm. in uh, not your native language. And so to me, that's the hardest is, is kind of planning my thoughts and maintaining structure and organization to my speeches when you know, sometimes you're stressed, you, you forget where you are, you forget a word or two, and it's harder because it's your second language or third, you know, it's, it's not your native language. Would you say that there are certain strategies you've learned along the way or workshops or um, mentors or colleagues or people who have helped you along in your Arabic language learning journey? Oh my gosh, there are many, in terms of my Arabic language journey, too many people to, to name or, mm -hmm. or thank individually, but I, I mean, first and foremost had a handful of amazing and really lovely teachers when I was in Jordan um, mm -hmm. at Qasid and elsewhere. Um, in terms of debate, though, I think I've mostly learned from my peers. And uh, this is maybe getting into what we'll talk about later in the podcast, but I've learned for a lot from one specific peer who m also is appearing in this podcast episode. Um, and also the professors we've had at UNC, I've learned a lot from um, Professor Maha Husami at Duke, mm -hmm. um, Ustaz Saad Al Hadi. Mm -hmm. I've learned a lot from you, Ustaz. Oh, shukran. <laughs> and I, you know, there's a big community of people who are, even if debate is not their first passion or, you know, it, it's not a big enough circuit, so to speak, for Arabic debate to be the only thing you do, which is Hopefully it becomes big enough for that to be the case in the future. But Absolutely. it's also beautiful in the sense that people are have different interests and are engaged in doing all these different things. Some people are philosophers, some people are engineers, and mm. we all kind of come together over Arabic debate, even if it's not our main thing. So there's many ways you can learn and from, from peers and, and faculty members. It's definitely a really unique environment. Just from what I've observed, this will be my first year coming along with the team, not to participate with the UNC or the Duke team, but to serve as a judge and get trained in being a judge mm. for the Arabic debates. So Jasper, really quickly, can you tell us how many years you've been debating? What teams have you debated with? Because this will definitely be our lead up to the rivalry that's becoming a little bit fiercer this year. So I've been debating for two years, kind of on and off, it, you know, becomes more intense around the competition times. I first debated at the 2021 U.S. University's Arabic Debate Championship in Chicago with the UNC team, uh, where we took the best non-native uh, team award, which we were really proud of. Mabruk. Allah barik Congratulations. Um, and we also, so then the year after that, I, for that year of school, was concurrently enrolled at UNC and Duke, doing some classes. Um, in the program in literature and also in Arabic. So doing some things not related to Arabic, but uh, fortunately that allowed me to compete with the Duke team at the sixth International Universities Debate Championship, I mm -hmm. believe, um, with aforementioned other podcast guests and our teammate Dana. Um, and we, were, we made it to the quarterfinals, which was really cool. And obviously a level of competition that is, is really impressive at the international level. 
um, which was fantastic. And so this will be my third competition. It's not a long resume. I wouldn't say it's a lot of experience, but I've enjoyed it. And you seem quite committed. Yeah, of course. It's, it's just fun at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And like I said, when I'm trying to balance these other languages I'm learning and different projects I'm working on, it's nice to have Arabic debate as this constant where I know that I'm going to keep up my Arabic. And I'm mm-hmm. going to be using it to think about interesting and challenging things and to be spending time with my friends. I would say I made a whole new set of friends last year when we kind of re- when we started up the UNC Arabic Debate Club. I met all these amazing people that I spent so much time with. So Yes. So on the note of starting the UNC Arabic Debate Club and this year returning to the national championships with the UNC team, you're the lead, you're the captain for the UNC team. How are you feeling, honestly, going into this year? I think that I'm very excited, first of all, because it's nice to see, you know, through attending different workshops and getting to know my teammates and teammate, people from other teams, it's, it's a social event as well, so it'll be nice to see all these people that I've met over the years. Um, I'm nervous, of course. I think um, it's, it's a competition, and so there's, there's nerves that are associated with that. But I think the, the biggest thing that I'm proud of, I guess, going up to leading up to the championship is that we've made Arabic debate something that is UNC, grounded at UNC here, that hopefully will continue after I graduate this year. Um, so, you know, regardless of what the, how we perform at the um, championship in Salt Lake City, I think it's just great that this is something that has a presence on campus now. Mm-hmm. And we have, you know, 10 to 15, sometimes more people who are coming every week, people who, grow, we have graduate students, we've got, I know, a uh, high school student from Carborough High School who uh, is interested and sometimes might be might be joining us soon. So Wait, really? Yeah, I know. That's great. I'm yeah. also the faculty advisor for she the hasn't heard about this UNC yet. <laughs> debate club, and I haven't heard about this yet, but that sounds amazing. Yeah, so it's I don't know. That's the biggest thing for me is I'm just I'm just excited that it's something that we have going on every week at UNC now. What have you all been doing at UNC to prepare for the debates? And what do you think might give you all an edge at the debate? Well, we've been talking about different issues every week. I think that that hopefully gives us an edge in the sense that we've been intentionally kind of trying to diversify the topics that we talk about, not just and, we, you know, because of the people we have in the club. So, f- say, for instance, I, if it was up to me, I would always kind of bring the same, like, politics, economics, things to the table. But we have other team members, like Yena, who knows a ton about biology, about healthcare, and is an expert in that field. And so she brings these different things, and Abdullah brings other things, and our teammate Sultan brings other things. And, you know, there's everyone brings something, so we have a diversity of interests that I think has helped us prepare well. Let me ask you this question. You mentioned before competing alongside of the Duke team. We know that there are lots of inroads between the UNC and the Duke. Ought to be programs, students collaborate, they celebrate together. We have faced off against one another multiple times. UNC won one time, Duke won one time. How fierce do you think the rivalry is? I think it's fierce. Um, I will say... You know, it, it, it is obviously fierce, and any time we play Duke in any, whether it be in basketball or Arabic debate, <laughs> we want to win. We want the Tar Heels to win. But what's really special about the relationship with UNC, between UNC and Duke, rather, especially in the Arabic programs, is that we all know each other. The professors know each other. It's a little bit of a family. I don't know. Maybe that's a cliched word to use, but... Not at all. We know each other, and we're friends, and we benefit a lot from you know, being in regular contact and community with one another. Yeah. So it's a rivalry, but it's a it's a friendly one in the true sense of a, a friendly rivalry. You know, when we say we're having a monavolo with the between U, UNC and Duke, it's it's truly in the fullest sense of that. Truly in the fullest sense of being a friendly debate. Absolutely. Yeah. Let me ask you, as a senior, getting mm-hmm. ready to graduate, leaving Chapel Hill, <laughs> what do you think are opportunities that you might be able to participate in down the road where these skills that you built debating and this love that you built for debating in Arabic, where do you think that might come into play? What opportunities might that bring for you? It's a good question. Well, I hope to one day become a lawyer. So it's not hard to kind of map on the debate skills you would think to that. But I mean, I've invested so much time in these languages because I hope that one day I will be able to use them. So doing legal work that has international that is international in scope would be interesting to me. But, I mean, I'll say I would also be totally content if, you know, 
20 years from now, the extent that I use my Arabic is just with my friends and to be mm -hmm. in community with people around me and be able to help out if someone who speaks Arabic needs something or, you know, just kind of be a community citizen that is connected to the Arabic speaking world or, you know, can help Arabic speaking community members. And just, you know, I already have so many friends that are Arabic speakers that naturally it's kind of just a part of my life. So yeah, being able to have debates with them, you know, when we're 50 or 60 years old would also be that would be perfectly fine. Absolutely. That would be great for That's me. That's way down the road. I love that. I love that vision, though. How do you think your Arabic language journey would have been different if you had not gotten into Arabic debating? It's a good question. I don't honestly know. I think it would have fallen into some degree of disuse if I, I didn't do debate because we have, you know, there's a lot of levels, there's a lot of things going on in Arabic at UNC, but there's kind of nothing that fills the space that debate does where at least for someone, once you reach a advanced level, you want to be talking to native speakers. You want to be engaging with kind of really challenging content. And I think debate, the debate club is the main space for that at UNC, kind of in an institutional setting. So I don't know if I would be using my Arabic in the same way. There's other things I do. I work as an interpreter and I work as, you know, I, I, I do multiple things related to Arabic, but this is one that I think challenges me the most. And so mm -hmm. I would be desperately wanting for something like that if it didn't exist. Do you see this Arabic debating nationally, internationally, having a role in raising the profile and professionalizing the teaching and learning of Arabic? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's first and foremost for students to see that this is something that you can, if you work hard, you can reach this level where it becomes Arabic. Your, I'm, I'm speaking specifically, you know, for non-native learners and of Arabic. I think debate shows that once you get to a certain level, it can become self-sustaining and easier in a way where you don't need to be doing flashcards all the time. You don't need to be, I mean, that helps obviously, but you can get to a level where you could get to kind of create and create relationships, debate, discuss things in Arabic. And I think that, I mean, in terms of foreign language teaching in the United States, I don't know of anything that's comparable to the kind of Arabic debate programs and infrastructure that exists in the United States. I don't so think I do either. I mean it would be awesome if there were, you know, there was Chinese debate or Russian debate. I'm maybe there is, but I'm not aware of it. And so that's something that keeps me engaged in learning Arabic in a way that I don't have with my other languages, mm -hmm. which I think is really special mm -hmm. and kind of makes foreign language learning exciting in a way that mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe other foreign language teaching disciplines, if that's the right phrase, need to step up their game. Mm -hmm. Do you see the future of Arabic debate growing in the U.S. or internationally? Of course, yeah. I think I, I, it absolutely should grow for all the reasons I, I just said. I think it's, yeah, yes. I'll say yes. I don't know if it needs a longer answer than that. For non-native speakers like yourself who are learning Arabic in the U.S. or in Europe, in the U.K., even in a program abroad in the Arabic-speaking world, what would be your best advice for how to learn the language hmm. and how to get into Arabic debating. I mean, I think, well, I'll say how to learn language first because that, that naturally comes before debate. Speak Arabic as much as possible. So, I mean, for those people who a certain portion of their Arabic language journey is study abroad, I think there's a tendency, a natural tendency of American study abroad students to kind of group together with other Americans and kind of experience, experience said you know, foreign country in some ways, but also keep the core of their social environment familiar and American or English speaking Anglophone. Um, and that's, there are a lot of reasons in which that is for why that's valid. And, you know, mm -hmm. being away from home can be challenging. But I think if you really want to learn Arabic, you need to put yourself in a setting in which your social environment is primarily Arabic speaking. Um, and that was not something that I was able to do, you know, right away after I moved to Jordan. But after being there for a couple months, I would say most of my friends, I only spoke Arabic with them. Um, and I was lucky to have friends who really cared about my Arabic getting better. If I said something wrong, they'd correct me, um, which I, you know, have always said to my friends. I mean, this is, it's a mindset thing, kind of being like, if I say something wrong, I want to be corrected immediately. Don't right. fear my feelings. I want to be corrected <laughs> um, in as direct of terms as possible. Um, there are other things, you know, that are important. I think just listening to podcasts, um, that's my main form of Arabic media consumption. There are flashcard apps. Certain flashcard apps are better than others. Anki being the good one. Wait, let's rewind. You like listening to podcasts? I do like listening to podcasts. But in Arabic? Well, yes, in Arabic. 
Okay. I, in English as well, but yes, but it's a plug for us to do versions of this podcast, this podcast in Arabic. In the future. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. This should we should definitely do it in Arabic. Um, maybe we'll record another version after this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Jasper, for students at college studying Arabic who have the chance to join in the Arabic debates, what's your best advice for them for how to get started, and really just how to dive in? I think you know even if you're just starting out in Arabic, you should just go. I mean, once you have a reasonable level where it's going to be enjoyable for you to listen and attend, just go. If your if your school has an Arabic debate club, go and listen and participate to the extent that you feel comfortable. But I think doing it maybe even when you don't feel entirely comfortable or confident is is pretty important. And going and seeing people who, you know, this is the case for me for sure, speak Arabic a lot better than you, oftentimes because they are native speakers of Arabic, a little unfair. It gives you a motivation. It gives you an incentive to kind of go home and listen and, and try to develop yourself in, in Arabic. I mean, it applies to other languages as well. Just go. Just do it. You know, we have a, a team of, of three from UNC, but when we do our debates every week, we mix up the teams. We have different people debate. We have, you know, probably 10 or so people, maybe more, who come regularly. Mm -hmm. And so those people are also debating with us all the time. So the pressure is not high. It's just friendly. We're, we're all... You know, where they're just there to have fun. So I'll end on this question, Jasper. How do you think UNC is going to do at the competition? I think we're going to do very well. You think you're going to do very well? UNC or Duke, who do you think will, will win out? I'm not going to, well, I, for the purpose of this podcast, I'm going to say UNC. For the purpose of the podcast, you'll say UNC. And I'm confident. I'm just not going to put it out there in the universe. I'm going to say we're gonna we're gonna do our absolute best, and that will be great for us. But I think we're I think our absolute best is gonna be pretty good. UNC always staying humble. I love that attitude. Shukran hey, it's the public Zilan. university ethos. It's, it's the public university ethos. Absolutely. Shukran Jazeel and Jasper for joining us today on All Things Arabic, and we hope to connect with you again soon at the national debating competition. Awesome. Thank you, Saza. So UNC is confident but still humble. What about Duke? Let's meet Majid, who, despite being a native speaker, says debating is also helping his Arabic. So I'm a junior at Duke University studying electrical engineering and computer science. Uh, I got into Arabic debating in the eighth grade, where I was like, an Arabic teacher of mine was like, oh, I'm starting this club in Kuwait. You should join. I went there for the first time. I was a bit nervous, but I really like the community and really like the vibe and like what topics are being taught taught there. So I said, okay, I want to pursue this. And little by little, I found myself like joining competitions and traveling all around the world to like pursue this goal of mine. Wow, that's amazing. So did you start the Duke Arabic debating team? It was already started before I came here. They had, they started the year in 2019 when a couple of students went to uh Harvard for the first U.S. competition, but it wasn't something like official or it wasn't like something where they used to train a lot. It was like, oh, we have a couple of students who speak Arabic. Let's just go to Harvard and compete. So once I came, me and other students decided to take to take action and make this a more formal thing. Okay, a more formal thing. So speaking of formal things, we know that this very formal, historical, grand rivalry exists between UNC and Duke who has the prettier campus, who has the best basketball team, which color of blue is preferred. I see you are wearing Duke blue today. I have my Carolina blue scarf in my bag. What do you think about the rivalry extending into Arabic debating? I like it. I feel like it's pushing us to be better. When I see Jasper texting me that they are having group meetings, I was like, they can't be better than us. We're the better shade of blue. So I take action by meeting more and like trying to put more efforts when I see other people put effort. So I feel like this rivalry is pushing both of us to be better. But the good thing is once we leave the state, we're together, we're both blue fighting other colors. So that's nice. I love that. That's absolutely amazing. So you mentioned that Duke participated in, was it the first yes. Arabic debating competition on the university levels in 2019? Yes, that was the first one. And yeah. Okay, wonderful. So both teams are going this year. How popular or big do you think Arabic debating is in the U.S. right now? Because you've traveled, you've competed, you've seen where else it is in the world. What's kind of your read on how Arabic debating is in the U.S.? I'm very happy to see that it's getting much bigger. Like in the first and second year, 
the organizer was trying to like get people to join. Now people are trying to join, like there's a wait list for people to join. So that's a very nice thing. And it's more than just like an Arabic debating thing. It's a place where you can go and meet other Arabic students, other people who are learning Arabic. So it's a great opportunity for Arabic language users in the US. Okay, wonderful. So I have a very practical question for you. How are you guys preparing for the debate? I won't tell Jasper. <laughs> so we have one problem. One of our debaters is in Minnesota right now. So he graduated less than six months ago. So he's allowed to join underneath Duke's name. So we're doing mostly Zoom meetings, like Zoom debates between us and each other. And the debate that's happening today is actually one of one of our training practices. That's awesome. Well, I'm sure you all will do very well today. And I think I could not agree with you more. I remember coming to the practice debate between UNC and Duke, hosted by Duke last year. This year, it's hosted by UNC. But I remember just being so amazed watching you all go full force and really work to, you know, put your best against one another, but for the purpose of learning and building one another up. Is there anything that you think will give your team an edge in debating this year? So we're the PATH champions, so that's give us a lot of confidence joining the debate. So that's one thing that we're looking forward to, and we're, we're looking forward to save that record and keep it back-to-back, -back, winning the national championship again. So I feel like we have the edge that we proven ourselves last time, so people are more afraid to debate us this time. So Duke, the 2022 National American University champions for Arabic debating, inshallah, this year, another Thanks. win. I'm struggling to say that a little bit because I'm actually a professor of Arabic at UNC. <laughs> so my allegiances really lie with the lighter shade of blue, but I could not agree with you more. It's like when I root for basketball. UNC is my number one. And whenever Duke is not playing against UNC, I can root for Duke. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So why should students be debating in Arabic? Why not debate in English? Like, do you see specific benefits to debating in Arabic? Is there a reason why you enjoy debating in Arabic versus English? I'm a native Arabic speaker, so that's one thing that I love. And oh, the second thing is that, like, Arabic used to always be a skill, but I never used it and utilized it in the right way. So whenever I wanted to prove a point or say an argument, I never said it in the correct way or I struggled to say it in Arabic and I found English much easier. Hmm. But I believe that like since it's my native my native tongue and like I should be able to say arguments using it, I, I had to learn how to like debate in Arabic. So learning all of these skills of argumentation and analysis and thinking on your feet and in the moment, do you think that having all of this experience debating in Arabic will bring other opportunities to you in the future? It definitely did. Like a lot of things that I did in high school were part of like how how I did well in debating. So I was in student government, for example, I'm doing a lot of stuff in like do student government right now. Mm -hmm. And I believe that like these skills were rooted from my debating experience. Mm -hmm. What kinds of students do you see getting involved in Arabic debating? Our main people who are joining the debating club are people who know how to speak who know how to speak Amiya but want to learn Fusha because debating gives you a better way to learn and use that Amiya and switch it into Fusha. Mm -hmm. Another uh, audience is the people who are learning Arabic and do classes, and these are people who are learning economics, political science. These, since these topics touch on that uh, these two majors. So for our listeners who might not know what Fusha is, it's the modern standard version of the language, which is what most people tend to debate in at the national debating competition. And Amiye would be the spoken, less formal variety of the language. So what do you think the most valuable aspects of debating in Arabic have been for you over all of these years of Arabic debating? Learning debating in a, in, a comp in a competition environment is very good because you're going to learn how to make arguments in a very fast pace. So this reflects on my day-to-day -day life when I'm, I, whenever I'm talking to someone. I don't have to think long to give up my response or to give my stance. So that's one thing that debating definitely changed in my, the way I speak. That's amazing. And what career path are you considering in the future? I still don't know, but I would love to work in public service in Kuwait. Okay, public service in Kuwait. Do you see yourself having the chance to use these skills that you've bit that you built over the years with Arabic debating? I would say so. For example, last summer in my internship it was definitely like a software side, but I was able to pitch a change 
And that was all through the skills that I learned through debating. Did they accept your change? They did. They did. They accepted your change. You won. That's awesome. How do you think debating might raise the profile of teaching Arabic? Like how are other people on Duke's campus looking at you all as Arabic debaters and viewing Arabic in a different way? I feel like it's a goal for every Arabic uh, learner at Duke right now. So we did a debate there where most of the students learning Arabic at Duke showed up and they all said that that's what they want to learn and that's the goal that they want to reach to be able to speak on a podium and prove, uh, prove their points. So I feel like it's definitely a goal for most Arabic learners. And back then, they did not have something to aspire to be. They did not have a person who spoke Arabic that they want to speak like him. So it's definitely setting a president how to speak Arabic in, at, at Duke. That's incredible. And it's a very, it's a very high precedent. It's a very high precedent. So I know that sometimes people going into the debating competition, you had mentioned this at the beginning, might feel nervous, might feel a little bit shy. Do you have any best advice for people just getting into Arabic debating? You're not going to be a good debater unless you debate. So just go deep into that comp first competition or that first friendly debate, and you're just going to learn on the spot. You're definitely going to make mistakes, but everyone makes mistakes, especially in a U.S. setting. The standard is not that high. So it's not as high as like international competition. So you can go there and just make, make mistakes. And then of the day, everyone there is trying to learn. So very supportive environment in yeah. the U.S. for anyone interested in getting involved in ought to be debating on the college as well as on the high school level, which we'll talk about in a further episode. Has the Duke community been supportive of you? You know, I know you're not an Arabic major. You're in a completely different major. How have your colleagues and your professors responded to you winning the national debating competition? It was very nice seeing Duke like posting it on their main social media and the Ames pr professors just everyone knows about that win. At first I thought like, oh, I'll go back to campus and no one will ever care about that win since like it's Arabic debating in the US. But it was very nice seeing my professors who are from different departments all knowing about that win and like congratulating me about that, even different students. So that's a very nice thing to see. Do you feel like the world of Arabic debating is actually a little bit smaller than it is bigger? It's getting bigger, definitely. Like, mm -hmm. I would say that my first year at UChicago, it was, I got, I got second best debater, but it was like, I wasn't very proud of it because the standard was not that high. It wasn't as competitive as like back in high school in Kuwait. Mm -hmm. But the last win at Stanford was definitely way more competitive. Mm -hmm. So I was a bit nervous when the decisions came. I, at first I thought like, I'll not be in like top five so that's why that win was much more valuable to me. And I'm excited to see that the level of like debate rise this year too. Rise every single year as it grows larger and more popular. Let me ask you just a few more questions for students who are learners of Arabic, not our heritage speaking students or students coming from abroad. Do you have any language advice for them as they're listening to this podcast? Maybe they're in intermediate Arabic or advanced Arabic. And, you know, they want ways to practice and they want things to focus on. Do you have any good advice for them? I would say for me personally, the most thing that like changed me and my the other debaters from Duke is just listening more. So of course, debating is an art of speaking, but I think it's more of an art of listening too. So listening how other and good debaters speak and what like language they use, what vocabulary they use is very important. Like back then when I was in high school, I used to watch like the international competitions like on a daily basis just to like learn from the best debaters out there. So it's definitely more about like listening than speaking. Mm -hmm. But in the end of the day, if you listen a hundreds of debates every day, that will not set you, that, that will not be enough. You'll have to practice and speak. So just don't be afraid to make mistakes in the end of the day. Yeah. What do you think is the future of debating here in the U.S.? I'm very excited to see it grow because I think we're like we have people who are like on par to be like one of the best debaters in the world. Like people like Jasper and the UNC team, even at Duke team, I think two years ago when we went to Turkey in Istanbul and we played in the internationals, we made it to quarterfinals and U Chicago also made it to quarterfinals. Two years before that, no one from the US made it to quarterfinals. So 
we're improving. And I'd say that we have a chance of becoming the best in the world. So it's just a matter of time until like we're going to compete and win the internationals. Yes. And you mentioned you're only a junior. So there's two whole more years of competing. That's amazing. Who do you think will win at the national competition in October? I think Duke has a very strong chance. Of course, I would, if not us, I would want UNC to win, but I still say we're better than UNC, so we're definitely it's us. Shukran kthir majidli wujudek aliyom. Thank you so much for being with us today. In terms of the debate that's coming up, are there things about this year that you're expecting to be a little bit different, that you're excited about, maybe you're a little nervous about, you kind of want to see how it pans out. So seeing other teams like UNC practice a lot is definitely something scary from our side. I think their level is going to increase in a very high level. So I'm excited to see that increase in like debate, like skills in the competition. And going from UChicago to Stanford was a shock of seeing how good people became. And I feel like this shock is going to happen this year, too. It's going to be a good shock. It's going to be a good shock. Like the shock we need. Okay, thank you so much again, Majid. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. My many thanks and shukar to both Majid and Jasper for their insights into debating in Arabic here in the U.S. and their useful tips and encouragement for anyone wanting to get involved. We'll be exploring debating in Arabic at the high school level in a future podcast episode. For now... Shukran Jazilan for joining us in today's episode of All Things Arabic. This podcast was made possible by QFI, Qatar Foundation International, a U.S.-based organization that helps make the teaching and learning of Arabic as accessible and professional as other world languages. Subscribe, like, share this podcast. Please do let your colleagues and friends know about it. And head over to the QFI website to learn more about opportunities and resources available to language educators and students. Ma'asanama!